Russia has had many failures in Ukraine, but its naval shortcomings are likely the most humiliating. Can Putin find a way out of this constant humiliation? Here's the scoop. Before the war, experts were worried that Russia's Black Sea fleet would help it to overwhelm Ukrainian resistance. For example, they feared that Russian ships stationed in Crimea would launch missiles into Ukraine free of retaliation. They also dreaded the possibility that the Black Sea fleet would assist in Russian amphibious operations, especially in an attack on Odessa, the third largest city in Ukraine. The success of such an operation would completely cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea and leave it as a landlocked rump state. In the earliest days of the war, these experts watched Odessa and the Black Sea fleet closely. Their attention was probably better focused elsewhere, because Russia's navy was, much like everything else in its military before the war, all talk and no show. Far from achieving naval supremacy in the war, Russia's navy has instead been effectively contained by Ukraine. What does this turn of events say about the Russian navy? In fact, the disaster did not come as a surprise to some experts, who had noted the decline in Russian naval capability ever since the fall of the Soviet Union. In this video, we'll take a look at the rather dilapidated state of Russian naval power. Ever since the days of Peter the Great in the early 18th century, Russia has aspired to become a sea power, often going to war to secure favorable coastline and ports. Unfortunately for Moscow, Geography is its greatest enemy in its quest for naval parity with other great powers. Most of Russia's ports freeze over in the winter. Others, such as those in the Baltic and Black Seas, are contained within choke points. This geostrategic weakness has proven to be a big challenge for Russia historically, and the same is true for its war in Ukraine. The 1936 Montreux Convention regarding the regime of the Straits permits Turkey to bar warships from passing through the Dardanelles and Bosporus during wartime cutting off transit between the Black and Mediterranean Seas. Turkey invoked the convention's wartime provisions for the first time a few days after Russia initiated its so-called special military operation. The invocation meant that Russia could not reinforce its Black Sea fleet, and as a result, Russia's naval brass became much more careful about deploying its existing ships. Such caution helped to ensure that the Russian army and navy would prove incapable of properly supporting each other throughout the war. The situation in Ukraine is only the latest example of geography getting in the way of Russia's quest for naval power. However, the Russian navy has far deeper problems. Command structure is one such problem. The Russian navy has no single command, making it difficult for Moscow to design and implement a comprehensive naval strategy and plan for new programs or updates to existing ones. Russia's navy has also suffered from a shortage of money, and much of the money that's been devoted to it has become misallocated due to corruption. Before the invasion of Ukraine, Russia's naval problems were getting more obvious. The fleet size has continually shrunk. Older ships are often taken to the scrapyard before newer ones can replace them. Because of this, Russia is slowly but steadily losing its naval presence in the Arctic, a region that China, with its expanding navy, is increasingly interested in. And even the Caspian Sea, where other post-Soviet countries are building their fleets. Russia's navy is aging too. The fall of the Soviet Union also caused the fall of much of the Russian shipbuilding industry. The end of the Cold War led to an end in the demand for many of the naval projects the Soviet Union had once required, atrophying the shipbuilding industry further. Skilled workers retired or had to find other jobs. Institutional experience began to evaporate. Important manufacturing equipment decayed. The shipbuilding industry was also partitioned as a result of the collapse. For example, much of the infrastructure that created the engines for Russia's warships wound up in Ukraine, since that is where much of them were built in Soviet times. As of November 10, 2023, the Russian Navy has a total of 265 fleet units, and the World Directory of Modern Military Warships ranks it third in capability behind the United States and Chinese navies. Russia has 185 fleet core units, such as destroyers, frigates, and corvettes, 58 submarines, 21 amphibious assault units, and one aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov. However, the Admiral Kuznetsov is indicative of Russia's deeper naval problems, so it's a case worth exploring. The aircraft carrier has been in dry dock for repairs since 2018, with the ship supposedly set to return to action in 2024. The repairs have been plagued by accidents and corruption. In 2019, a serious fire broke out. 
two years later, the Director General of the Murmansk shipyard, where the repairs were taking place, was arrested on suspicion of embezzling rubles equivalent to about $600,000. Only one example of the widespread corruption in the Russian Navy we've mentioned before. Even if it were repaired and returned to action in 2024, the Admiral Kuznetsov would not help to change the situation in Ukraine for Russia's forces because it cannot be moved to the Black Sea. The Admiral Kuznetsov is also not a state-of-the-art aircraft carrier. Although it was built in the 1980s, which was around the same time as many of the Nimitz-class carriers in the US Navy's fleet, it does not operate with a modern catapult system like they do, Instead, it uses the STOBAR, short takeoff but arrested recovery, method. This means that it cannot launch its planes as rapidly as America's aircraft carriers, making it a less capable asset in power projection for Russia. The Admiral Kuznetsov is not the only less-than-modern ship in the Russian fleet. The Russian Navy's combined median hull age is 30 years. In comparison, the median hull age in the United States Navy is 23.3 years. At first glance, this would not seem too far behind, and it's true that the United States Navy has been collecting aging vessels, but as we will see shortly, America can fully replenish its fleets over a reasonable time. Russia has much deeper difficulties on its hands. When they have seen action, Russia's antiquated naval vessels have experienced problems in Ukraine. The most famous example came in the sinking of the flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, the Moskva, in April 2022. Despite the Moskva's being an air defense cruiser, it sank when it got hit by a pair of Ukrainian Neptune anti-ship cruise missiles. Since the attack, observers have wondered how the Moskva's S-300F and 9K-33 OSA air defense missiles, its close-in 30mm cannons, chaff, decoys, and electronic warfare systems could have all failed to prevent the attack. Meanwhile, after getting hit, the Moskva did not prove survivable. It was a 40-year-old ship whose fire extinguishing systems were outdated. Ukraine has also frequently used drone boats to damage or destroy Russian ships. On November 10th, Ukraine released footage of the drones at it again, attacking Russian landing ships. Footage showed at least one of them on fire in the water after an impact. Russia's navy has proven incapable of adapting to the demands of the war in Ukraine, and it appears that it will not be able to do so anytime soon. The sinking of the Moskva and other naval difficulties was a predictable result for some Russian military watchers who had been complaining that their country's fleet was aging poorly. Prior to the war, Putin had claimed that improving the Russian Navy's combat abilities was a priority of his. However, economic and logistical difficulties got in his way. Although Russia's defense spending increased under Putin, Russia has often lacked the manufacturing ability to modernize its armed forces. This lack of capacity would not be new or only confined to the Navy. Russia proved unable to manufacture the T-14 Armata tank or Su-57 Felon fighter jet in large numbers prior to the war. In many respects, the naval problems are worse, because the Soviet Union's industrial institutions were never adequately replaced after they shrunk or vanished. Prior to the invasion, Russia had attempted to build new guided missile frigates of the Admiral Grigorovich class for its Black Sea fleet but sanctions following Russia's unilateral annexation of Crimea prevented this from happening. In an irony, Russia needed engines made in Ukraine to propel these ships. In 2019, Russia had hoped to add 14 more of the supposedly stealth Admiral Grigorovich-class ships to its fleet, but only had the engines required for two of them. Russia tried to develop domestic gas turbine engines as a replacement for the engines Ukraine denied it, but has not yet begun production. In 2019, NPO Saturn, the Russian company tasked with manufacturing the engine for the new frigate, claimed that it had got its initial orders from the Ministry of Defense. However, sources quoted by Reuters at the time said that there was no guarantee about how many engines the MOD would actually buy. Ukrainian observers said that it would be at least five years before production of these engines began. Much more severe sanctions imposed since then will make the problem of building new ships for Russia's surface fleet that much steeper. Russia has also had a problem maintaining its existing surface fleet. The fire on the Admiral Kuznetsov during repairs in 2019 was only one of the many accidents and episodes of mismanagement that the Russian Navy is prone to. For example, the Kara-class cruiser Kerch caught fire in 2014 under mysterious circumstances. A shipyard fire in 2016 damaged a new minesweeper that was under construction too. And if you thought the repairs to the Admiral Kuznetsov were slow, Consider that the Soviet-era nuclear-powered cruiser Admiral Ushakov 
had been idle for nearly two decades before 2019, when the Russian naval brass finally decided to scrap it. Russia originally had plans to modernize all of its Kirov-class nuclear-powered cruisers, but in 2012 announced that it would do so on only one of them, the Admiral Nikimov, scrapping the others. This is all part of a trend. The 265 fleet units in the Russian Navy as of 2023 is a sharp decline from the 360 ships that American observers believed it had on hand in 2019. That year, Russia saw the delivery of 23 new surface ships, a fact which brought a lot of fanfare in its homeland. However, just seven of these were armed combatants. The others were small missile corvettes that displaced no more than 2,000 tons of water. Displacement matters. One of the more accurate ways to measure the true power of a country's navy is through its combined tonnage. Heavier ships can not only carry more weapons and absorb more damage, but they can also stay at sea for longer. For example, the United States builds large warships because they often need to travel thousands of miles from ports in the homeland to reach their destinations and perform their worldwide missions. Heavier ships can carry more fuel and other supplies. Lighter ships are more vulnerable, less powerful, and can stay at sea for a limited amount of time. This is one of the reasons why American experts are not overawed by China having the world's largest navy by total vessels. Most of the Chinese ships are light and would fare poorly in a direct confrontation with the United States Navy. Now, as Russia steadily retires its Cold War era fleet, it is increasingly facing the same problem that China has – a fleet of small vessels with limited displacement. For example, Russia has built new Bayan and Bayan M corvettes. However, these supposedly new ships lack anti-air and anti-submarine capabilities. They are also small and incapable of operating far from the coast. The new Kyrokurt-class ships are better able to operate in deeper waters, but they also lack anti-air and submarine capabilities. In 2019, the Russian Navy displaced a total of only 1.2 million tons. The United States Navy displaced 4.6 million. The gap has grown further since then as a result of Russia continuing to retire older, heavier ships and replacing them with lighter ones. The result is that Russia has an aging surface fleet increasingly in need of repairs and unable to modernize despite the increase in defense spending. Meanwhile, the newer ships being delivered to the Russian Navy are not adequately replacing the ones being scrapped. Russia's surface fleet is getting smaller, less capable in battle, and less able to project power over long distances. We've seen that firsthand in Ukraine, where Russia has been unable to establish naval superiority in the Black Sea west of Crimea despite its opponent having no navy. Russia's ships are too old, vulnerable, and incapable of supporting amphibious operations. To make matters worse, the new ships seem to have little strategic purpose, which expects any confrontation between it and the United States to take place in the waters of the first island chain close to its territory. There is rationale behind building smaller vessels that can operate close to bases on the Chinese mainland. For Russia, however, this rationale does not exist. Because of its geographical isolation from the world's waterways, it needs larger ships if it is to project naval power abroad. However, Russia is steadily losing its Blue Water Navy and is increasingly contained to the less-than-ideal waters near its coastline. Russia's submarine fleet appears to be better off than its surface vessels. For example, it's in a much better place than China, which still lags far behind in underwater warfare. Of Russia's 58 submarines, 37 of them are nuclear-powered, 11 of these are ballistic missile submarines. 17 of them are conventional attack submarines, and 9 are cruise missile submarines. The other 21 submarines are less modern diesel-electric attack submarines. However, just like the surface fleet, Russia's submarine fleet continues to shrink in size. The current force of 58 submarines is a downward trajectory from the 61 that Russia had in 2015, and its precipitous decline from the 366 submarines the Soviet Navy had in 1985. Although much of the reduction in fleet size had to do with the end of the Cold War, Russia has lacked the money needed to build new submarines to replace the older ones reaching the end of their service life. For example, it needed to scale back the production of its Oscar II-class nuclear-guided missile submarines and Akula-class attack submarines. The lack of funds delayed the more modern Yasin-class attack submarines too, with the first one taking 20 years to build. Only two of them exist. Russia's diesel-electric submarines, the Kilo-class, have proven easier to build, thanks in part to international exports to countries like India. India has 12 Kilo-class submarines in its fleet, domestically called the Shishuma-class. However, in 2013, one of these caught fire and exploded, 
raising questions about the viability of its design. Just as Russian tanks are becoming a less popular item for international buyers, Russia's naval designs are facing the same problem, further depriving the Kremlin of the money it needs to modernize its military. Russia's submarine fleet has played almost no role in the war in Ukraine. Instead of missiles from Russian submarines hitting Ukrainian targets, the opposite has proven the case. In September 23, Ukraine launched Storm Shadow cruise missile attacks on the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Crimea. A Russian submarine was one of the targets hit in this attack. Are there ways for Russia to make up for its growing naval disadvantages? To cover the shortfall in domestic industrial capacity, Russia has considered importing naval engines from China, but that's a prospect which comes with its own shortfalls. China's military technology is questionable at best, and in the face of international sanctions following the invasion of Ukraine, such orders will make Moscow even more dependent on Beijing. China could drive a hard bargain in Russia's pursuit of a modern navy. Russia is also trying to create new domestic ship designs that will help to mitigate its shortcomings. However, these seem to lack proper coordination. The Russian Navy has been designing three different frigate and five different Corvette-class ships at the same time with little coordination. The lack of a unified naval command is playing a part here, and the competing projects are draining money from the Navy's coffers instead of allowing it to concentrate on the best design. One might consider it a worse version of the United States Navy's literal combat ship program, which saw two different designs drain money from other, more promising ways it could have been used. Russia has had hopes for Project 23560 LIDA, a large destroyer which supposedly could, if built, adequately replace the Udaloy or Sovremeni destroyers, which are typically over 30 years old. Project 23560 LIDA is also supposedly capable of replacing the Russian Navy's four Slava-class cruisers, the youngest of which is the 25-year-old Pyotr Veliki. The Russian Navy designed the LIDA to be a competitor for the United States Navy's stealth Zumwalt-class destroyers, which began commissioning in 2016. The LIDA was first unveiled in March 2015, as the Zumwalt program was ramping up in America. However, the LIDA-class destroyer remains theoretical. In 2021, sources claimed that construction would begin in 2023, but this has not happened. There were rumors that the program had been scrapped, with it being dropped from the Kremlin's 2025 state armament program. Sources in Russia's shipbuilding industry then noted that the program had not been scrapped, but funding for it had been reduced. And as we've seen, because Russia lacks shipbuilding infrastructure, it could take decades for the first LIDAR-class destroyer to be completed, even if construction starts. As a result of these problems, Russia is stuck with trying to modernize its existing destroyers, which, as we've seen, is a daunting prospect on its own. If Russia could update the ships adequately, such as outfitting them with modern sensors, they could theoretically stay relevant. However, given the Russian Navy's history of corruption, shortage of money, and demonstrated poor planning, that's not a prospect one should be excited to bet on. The inability of the Russian Navy to bring the LIDAR-class destroyer to reality for institutional problems and lack of funding is an embarrassment for the Kremlin, but it's part of a common historical thread that spans beyond Russia. Maintaining and modernizing military forces is and always has been an expensive business in money and institutional energy. Historically, this reality has meant that most nations have needed to concentrate on either land or sea power. For example, the United Kingdom spent heavily on the Royal Navy during its imperial century, but only kept a small, although very capable and professional, land army. Russia may have long sought to be a sea power, but its geography has dictated that priority must be put into its land forces. It may have pretensions to the contrary, but post-Soviet Russia does not have the resources to build up a top-quality navy. As we've seen in Ukraine, it will need to concentrate on its army even more as it will emerge from the war depleted of men and material. Increasingly, a navy is a luxury that Russia cannot afford. But what do you think about the state of the Russian Navy? Is there anything the Kremlin can do to turn the situation around? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.